Hello, I'm Eric Schumacher Rasmussen. I'm the editor and VP of Streaming Media and the conference chair for Streaming Media Connect. This is our seventh Streaming Media Connect. We were talking before we went live here, the panelists and I, this will not be necessarily our last virtual event, but it's our last one for a while, certainly as we are planning to be in person in Boston on May 24th and 25th for Streaming Media East. May 23rd, there will also be Streaming Media University workshops and the Content Delivery Summit back in person for the first time in a couple of years, and I can't wait. Registration is open for those events right now at streamingmedia.com forward slash east, and the program should go online any day now. But we're in the midst of another terrific virtual event. We've had some great panels so far and have more to come, culminating on Friday with a long three-hour workshop that will not seem like three hours, I guarantee you, if you're into streaming media production. It's called The Best Streaming Gear and How to Use It. And as always, if you miss any of these sessions at the time they occur, they'll be available on demand uh, not long after we wrap things up. I'd like to thank our Diamond sponsors, Bird Dog and Harmonic, and we've got a, a brief video message from each of them right now. also like to thank the sponsor of this panel, Amagi, and uh, Amagi's Paul Brickle will be joining us on the panel in just a minute. A couple of housekeeping notes just for being here. You're entered into a random drawing to win an Amazon gift card. I'll announce the winner at the end of the panel, and you will receive an email next week with more details if you win. If you have questions for our panel, please put them in the Q&A tab at the bottom of your Zoom window rather than putting them in the chat. It's just easier for us to keep track of them that way. We won't be calling on people who raise their hands, so all questions go to the Q&A tab. And you will see also that live transcripts are enabled. If you're seeing transcripts on your screen right now and want to get rid of them, you can go to the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom window, click on it, and then select disable transcript. So with that, I will welcome our moderator, Magnus Svensson, coming to us all the way from Stockholm, where it's- Hello, hello, Eric. Hey, how are you? I'm good. I'm coming in from a cold and rainy Stockholm. So it's well, getting a habit now that is dark and rainy when we have these seminars. So I hope to it can be get better, better soon. Well, we've got cold and rainy weather here in uh, Wisconsin where I'm at, although it's a little bit lighter here than it is there. Yep. All Ooh. right. Well, you've got a great group of panelists uh, talking about the growth of fast services internationally. And so I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Eric. Yeah, as Eric mentioned, I'm Coming in from Stockholm, Sweden, I work at a company called Ivan Technology. We're an independent streaming media business out of Stockholm, Sweden, but with a global customer base helping clients across the world with streaming related competence. And as Eric mentioned, we have a great panel and a great panelists coming up for this uh, panel. And I, 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 as being part of the prep meetings, I, I know for sure this will be very interesting. So it will be worth spent hour. So. I will introduce the panelists one by one and let them introduce themselves and their company a bit, and then, then we'll, we'll take it from there. So starting from what I see on my screen, it's Nick. Welcome, Nick. Hi, Magnus. <clears throat> nice to be here. So uh, yeah, Nick Colsey, uh, VP of Business Development for Sony Electronics, uh, looking after uh, a number of categories, including uh, the smart TV. And uh, I've been doing this stuff since 2007, since um, pretty much before 
uh, before it even existed. So uh, happy to be on the panel today. Thank you, Nick. And next on my list is Paul. Welcome, Paul. Hi, Magnus. Hi, Nick. Um, yeah, Paul Brickle, Amagi uh, Product Marketing. Uh, we deliver fast uh, channels, live linear channels uh, globally. I'm um, looking forward to, to today's discussion. Thank you, Paul. And Stefan. Hi, everybody. Stefan Vanningen. Uh, I lead content partnerships and content strategy for Zumo, uh, a fast platform and enterprise solutions uh, vendor for our content partners. And I'm happy to be on this panel. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And we have Brett. Hi, thanks, Magnus. Brett Sappington, Vice President uh, at Interpret. Interpret is a market research and insights firm based in LA. I'm in the Dallas office and I lead the company's video entertainment research practice. I've been doing this for about 20 years, which is hard to believe. <laughs> and last but not least, Olivier from Paramount. Hi, everyone. I'm Olivier Jolet. Uh, I'm uh, the senior vice president and general manager of Pluto TV International, a division of Paramount, formerly known as Viacom CBS, just <laughs> rebranded, uh, as you probably have saw in the news. Um, and I'm overseeing the um, all the international business. So right now it's uh, 25 markets, uh, and Pluto TV is the uh, is the number one fast uh, service uh, in the world. Thank you, and. When we started off the preparation for this panel, Brett immediately shared some quite interesting data on, on the viewership. And, and it's mainly from the US to start with. And I think that sets a good base. So maybe, Brett, you can share some insights and data that actually astonished me a bit and surprised me a bit. Sure. Well, we've been, uh, we have some survey data around uh, ad supported services and fast services. And it's really interesting to see how it's grown today. About 55% of US consumers have watched an ad supported streaming service, whether it's subscription or free ad supported within the past 90 days. Of those about two thirds say that they watched in that same period, one of the fast services, whether it's Pluto or Zumo or uh, one of the others that's available. Uh, in many cases, these are also consumers who have an appetite for linear services or linear ad supported. So. Uh, among fast viewers, about 70% watch cable TV, 72% watch broadcast uh, TV. So they're interested in, in linear channels. But in looking at fast viewers, we see a real uh, diversity. We have two prominent groups. One are the video lovers. So about 30% of fast viewers spend over $100 a month on uh, streaming services, and about 37% spend under $25 for um, fat for streaming services. So you see this massive difference between the video lovers and those who are, we'll say, the video frugal. So they're interested in what they can do to kind of save money. So really interesting, and it's an evolving space, and we continue to see really fascinating information about how uh, about the viewers. Yeah, well, I think this was really interesting because I, I didn't honestly expect that the video lovers were such a fast lovers as well. So it, that, that surprised me a bit. So, Paul, you also had some some more global data maybe to share as so we get some some perspective. Yeah, no, that uh, that's really interesting diversification of the audience that uh, Brett called out that I, I wasn't quite aware of either. Uh, one of the unique things about Amagi is, uh, you know, being one of the leaders in, in, in the fast space uh, makes it really difficult to say fast and, and things that happen rapidly without it turning into a pun. Um, but we do see quite a bit of data uh, as a result of right now we're delivering close to 2000 channels globally. Uh, so we have some interesting insights that is, is kind of what's the coolest thing about cloud computing and, and SaaS in general is the ability to uh, pull data from these data lakes. Uh, so, for example, we saw, uh, you know, the number of channels we are delivering almost double in the last year. Uh, we've 
we've seen, uh, we were able to derive some uh, classification of content that people are consuming across the various regions. It, it's probably no surprise that the most popular content on these fast channels is, is news. Uh, that's pretty much true worldwide. Uh, US, extremely popular news consumers. Um, EMEA tends to, at least with the Amagi platform, we're seeing EMEA uh, gravitate towards documentaries. Uh, in Asia PAC, uh, a lot of music channels uh, are driving the most impressions. And in uh, LATAM, it's, it's food-based channels. Um, so that data shifts a little bit when you start comparing impressions versus uh, hours of content viewed. Uh, news you know, kind of gravitates to the top in Asia Pac uh, and movies replaces food in Latin America. But uh, ideally we're getting to a place where you know, we're, we're, we're gonna be able to help content owners better understand what is the best content for maybe a given platform in a given region at a given time slot, and we can get a bit more prescriptive with how consumers um, view content. Cool. It, it's interesting that they're quite quite the same, but still regional differences or or global differences. I think I, I recall you, Nick, had some some Latin America figures to to share as well. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> Sony sells. Um, Smart TV is in 194 countries around the world. So uh, we do know a little bit about what's going on globally um, as far as uh, smart TV usage and consumption is, is concerned. Um, I look after the Americas region, uh, which includes Latin America as well as North America. And um, yeah, seeing some, um, some quite significant uh, differences. Um, you know, in Latin America, um, free ad supported VOD or um, you know the free services which include fast have now overtaken uh, cable and satellite TV so they're uh, they're more frequently used than uh, than cable and satellite TV um, and I think that um, uh, you know that crossover happened um, in uh, in early 2021 or late uh, 2020 so this is um, uh, coincides with the with the pandemic not sure if that uh, if, uh, probably contributed to it SVOD is still um, in the lead. Um, so I think SVOD usage is about 87%. Um, uh, free, including fast, is 70%. Um, but, uh, you know, that's not necessarily just Netflix. Um, what you find in the Latin countries is um, low credit card adoption, uh, which means, doesn't mean people don't want to pay for content. It just means that it's uh, a little bit more of a barrier to entry for the international services, the big uh, usually US-based companies to come into Latin America. Uh, you know, the lack of credit cards actually gives an advantage to the local SVOD um, providers. Uh, but yeah, AVOD is, um, is definitely uh, uh, very close uh, and I think catching SVOD. And, um, uh, you know, we can talk more about uh, some of the details behind that, but um, uh, there's still a lot of work to do, I think, by the, by the AVOD providers in making the content more localized uh, and especially the ads. A lot of the ads are not really localized at all. Um, so that's uh, that's been a pain point in Latin America. Any comments from the services? Start with Stefan. Yeah, I think Nick's exactly right. When, when Zumo jumped into the international markets, it was just about sort of getting some content out there, helping extend some of our content partners in a lot of cases, we focused on sort of nonverbal U.S. providers, uh, you know, highly visual, highly action sports based, and then over time started to localize. But a few of the lessons learned over the last few years, we started this in 2018, but in the last few years, and I, I think um, this would be no, no, uh, this will not be strange thoughts to, to Olivier, but uh, was that one, uh, they don't really want uh, U.S. content, right? It really needs to be localized. Two, really needs to be, if it is uh, sort of U.S. content, movies, et cetera, really needs to be dubbed, not subtitled, right? Um, and then three, on the ad side, we also found that that is lagging behind. So both from a programmatic standpoint, but also from a direct uh, seller standpoint, which makes the experience a little bit more uh, 
intolerable, right? It's funny to say that ads make a service more tolerable, but if you hit a big ad break and you're sitting on a slate for two minutes that says, we'll be right back, um, you know, that's always uh, actually less appealing than filling the entire ad break. So, um, so th those are a few of the lessons that we learned. And then the last thing I would add is for services that originate in the US that are now expanding internationally, whether they're through smart TVs or connected devices or apps or mobile, you know, I think it's a different marketing approach. When you think about the US and you think about why fast has taken off, there's always an economic component. There's the, there's the slow degradation of cable television and people wanting to cut the cord and uh, wanting access to free content. Whereas it's a different marketing message um, across Europe where you know the, the national broadcasters offer premium content for free already. So you have to sort of connect into the audiences that can find stuff that they can't find uh, from, from premium providers or national broadcasters and really focus in and, and have a content strategy that works territory by territory. Olivia, you have been nodding a couple of times. I, I, I get the feeling that you're, you're agreeing to most of the things, but maybe your angle on things. No, I, I agree with a lot of the things which have been said. I think um, clearly, I mean, Pluto TV today is live in 26 countries. Uh, we are uh, uh, communicated yesterday, new member, new numbers. We are uh, reaching 64 million monthly active users by the end of Q4, uh, getting 10 million only in, uh, in, in the last quarter. Um, and, and clearly what we've been seeing is a, is a fantastic adoption of FAST uh, and especially Pluto in that case, uh, across the world. So uh, we live in Latin America and Brazil, but also in all the top five countries in Europe. And um, as, uh, as Stefan was saying, uh, the marketing messages uh, differs, but I think what is interesting is whether you go in a very strong uh, uh, cable uh, 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 market like the US or in Latin where free is, uh, is, is very appealing, or in, in, in Europe where, uh, where you have a, a very strong free to air business and great premium content already available for free, uh, including on the, um, the BVOD uh, slash catch up platform uh, from those big broadcasters, FAST is appealing. And it's appealing because of several topics. The first one is the model, the linear, the lean back approach that FAST is taking. Um, I think solving the, the paradox of choice um, we are living in a kind of content jungles where it starts to be difficult for users uh, to, write, to find the right piece. And probably uh, they don't want to spend 20, 30 minutes each time they want to be entertained. And I think FAST is a solution to this problem when you want to just lean back and get inspired by a great creation team. That is exactly uh, um, what, is, uh, what the, the, the editorial team of Pluto is doing. And I think the second point that I want to mention is the importance of local content. You touched base on that, Stefan, but um, uh, we've been really building local team in every single market where we launch, uh, leveraging really uh, also the power of Vacom CBS being already an international company, having, ed uh, having headquarters in all the big cities um, and, and, and all the countries where we went live, uh, we have like, 80 to 90 percent, even some of the countries, 100 percent of the content is local. Local means not only dub content, but also local means really content from the countries. Um, we, we're talking about TV, and I, I think there is differences on the, the kind of content watch on fast services versus the one watch on SVOD. Uh, and while this VOD tends to be maybe a bit more global, uh, we talk about TV and TV remains very local. So you need to have the local talents. You need to have the local shows on new platform to be successful. And that is exactly the strategy that we've been following, building really editorial teams, some curators in each market uh, who knows exactly what the users in Spain, in the UK, in Germany, in Latin America wants to watch. Uh, and I think it's probably one of the reasons why we are so successful today as well. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I agree with the local uh, locality there, and we'll probably touch that a bit more. But we see a quite fast growth of fast. So, Brett, why do you see? Why do you think we have this growth of fast and AWOD and, and ad-funded services now? 
Well, I think that it's a different viewing model. I think that consumers can use it and consume it in a very different way than they do video on demand. There still remains a significant percentage of U.S. consumers, certainly, that have a pay TV service. So 56% have that. And particularly for older consumers, that's, that's the viewing model that they're accustomed to it. So to go to something that's free like that, that, rep, that has a UX that's familiar to them, uh, is comfortable. And so they're accustomed to that. There are many viewing models to where you don't have to make a decision. In fact, many of the on-demand services uh, have moved to where a portion of their interface allows the, con the continual play. So if you don't say something, it'll go on to the next program. You may not like the next program, but um, it allows that. Um, and with Fast, you can choose the content type that you want and it'll continue down that thread of content. And so you can continue whether you're working or doing, it's, it's in, it can even be in the background and watching it that way. So I think from the research that we're seeing, a lot of the people who use Fast and like Fast um, really buy into the model. Uh, that it has, and it's, it's unique from other streaming services, and, and uh, having something unique and differentiated uh, is important. Paul, you mentioned that that you had doubled the amount of channels just lately now with, with what you're providing, and, and what is what what do you think is the main reason for that amount of, of new channels coming in? Yeah, I think as Brett mentioned, you know, a, a lot of it is driven from you know the U.S. viewing behaviors and and as people grabbing toward gravitating towards, uh, you know, free content, cheap, cheap or less expensive content, uh, ad supported content. Uh, obviously, the pandemic uh, caused a bit of a, a spike in viewing behavior. Uh, and so I think we'll see, you know, we've seen quite a bit of growth come out of that. Uh, it'd be interesting to see how that normalizes over the hopefully coming year. Um, as we see behaviors shift back to uh, out, outside of the walls of your apartments and houses. Um, so I think that's been driving a fair amount of growth. Uh, at least in the U.S., we're, we're seeing a, a fair amount of growth as as uh, EMEA starts embracing more fast type services. We're seeing a, a fair amount of growth in our fastest probably growing region is Asia Pac right now. Uh, and that's, I, I think as people are, you know, also challenged by some of the things Nick uh, brought up with a lot of subscription services and even pay TV services require telco authentication or, or things of that nature, which is smaller barriers that are, are giving giving viewers and consumers new outlets and new uh, options for viewing content. Um, but the other thing I, I thought I would, I would reference is when we talk about fast, I think a lot of people think about fast as primarily, can I get to Pluto? Can I get to Zumo? Can I get to Tubi? And all the, you know, the, the popular fast platforms that we are probably most familiar with. Uh, but there's a lot of content that is being delivered you know, in a faster or linear ad supported fashion to O&O apps as well. So we're seeing app stores fill up with uh, content owners creating their own fast experiences within their platform, which I think is driving a fair amount of growth as well. And so we, you know, the, the channels that we see pop up are, are you know, the, obviously the most popular ones are coming up on Samsung and Roku and Pluto, uh, Zumo in the US, uh, but we're also seeing, you know, the number. Well, we support, you know, over 50 platforms today, and you know, probably closer to 100 as we start getting into the, you know, O and O apps as well. Olivia, you mentioned quite a lot of, of differences when it comes to the, the Latin American European markets. But are the reasons for fast adoption the same across the globe, or is it the US phenomenon that is pushed to the rest of the world because it's popular in the US and it, it will become popular globally? Well, that's a great question. I think the interesting thing, you know, when Pluto TV was founded in 2014 and we launched on April. Uh, uh, on, on April Fool's Day 2014. Uh, and I think at that time, I think everyone thought we were fools because, uh, you know, bring a linear product. And I remember when Tom Rand, the founder of the company, was 
uh, doing fundraising, people were asking me, where is the innovation? Why are you doing an EPG? Why are you doing a TV guy? That's old school. And actually his answer was, what well, that is the innovation. That is the, the TV guide. It's you know, bringing something that people knows uh, into the streaming world, you know? And innovation doesn't mean always to bring something that people don't, don't, don't know at all. And I think this is something which is common to all markets that, you know, everyone grew up with television, linear television. Everyone grew up zapping between the channels, you know, and enjoying it uh, in, 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 in that way. And, you know, clearly, um, while the SVOD services are giving the freedom to choose, we also see like another uh, behavior, which is people sometimes just don't want to choose, choose and want to get programmed in a way. And, 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 and I think that's, that's one thing which is interesting. The second thing, which I think is extremely exciting when it comes to fast servicing and apply across the world is the fact that when you're running like a traditional TV business, and that's a trend that I've been seeing across the world, the, the traditional broadcaster are going mainstream and mainstream because the only way to monetize is have a lot of reach and the, the way you make business. When you run a digital business, you can go into niche content uh, because obviously you're building an ecosystem where users may switch from channel to channels, but the channels still belong to your ecosystem. So you can monetize like a, a, a niche channels around Korean drama channels or whatever the, the, the niche is. Um, well, it starts to be really difficult to do that on TV. So I think the, the, the beauty of the fast business is that you are not only offering an experience that you know, you're also uh, creating a new experience in the way you watch content. So, and this, those principles for me apply across the world. Afterwards, you have like obviously specificities and mainly on the content, but you know, when, when I remember when we launched first international um, and the first market we launched at Pluto were the UK and then just a few months later, Germany, there was a big question mark whether there was a market for that. And the reason was quite simple, and you touched base on that, uh, Stephen, the US is there was this cut cutting movement, people going away from, from, uh, from, from uh, cable, uh, cable subscription. And obviously Pluto was a free, kind of free fat bundle. Um, and it was a, a, a super strong proposition. When you go in market where you have a strong free to air market, where you have amazing premium content for free, is there a market for fast? And the answer is yes. And I think that's 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 a great thing. And you see, like across and Amagi, you uh, um, it's, it's, it's a great example across all the region, including Asia. You see the same trends. Uh, you also saw some uh, big SVOD uh, players, such as Netflix, testing also fast channels within their interface. Uh, um, and I think that shows that um, the experience that. Uh, uh, fast services like Pluto are bringing is international, but then if you want to be successful, it goes back again to content, but also to the way you are doing the ad experience. That is something which is very important. The ad experience from the US, a lot of ads, very short ad breaks uh, every six, seven minutes or 10 minutes is something that will kill the business if you go to Europe, for example, because people are not used to that. So there is like the need of not only localizing the content, but localizing the ad experience. Yeah. It's interesting that you say that, Olivier, because one of the things we've seen over time with pay TV is that when you go into markets like Germany in Europe, they're accustomed to free content. And so um, selling video services in Germany for years, it was basically, it was on things like HD or sports or something like that really drove that. And so they became accustomed to free content. And that's common across the world where free content is available. So you can really see why there's kind of fertile soil for free channels uh, from many markets. I, I Stefan, would, do you think, Stefan, do you think there are countries or demographics or, or parts of the world where fast will not be adopted as quickly or as, 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 as huge as the rest of the world? Well, I'm just going to say this because Nick is on this panel as well, but you know, uh, when you think about Pluto and you think about Zumo, you think about the apps, right, in connected devices on smart TVs, but both Pluto and Zumo are deeply integrated into some of the OEM manufacturers as well. 
And I think the, the sort of rapid spread is because the smart TV companies are, and Nick said it in his introduction, are international distributors of the hardware. And uh, that, you know, we talk about barriers for credit cards or barriers by language or barriers by content. But what the smart TV companies are doing are taking away the barrier of a connected device, the barrier of a set top box and the UI and the, and the user experience on those, on those devices has become simpler, easier, quicker to find, and they're already distributed around the world. And so that would be another reason why you're seeing this sort of explosion of fast is just the ease and the distribution from the Sony's, LG, Samsung's of the world. Yeah. So Nick, uh, any comments there? Uh, I, would yeah, I think uh, navigation is 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 key to this. Um, uh, you know, if you uh, if you don't have a, a Sony TV, um, then um, just uh, uh, you know one of the key ways that we um, uh, surface these, uh, especially these um, linear centric uh, channels like the fast services, is by integration into the TV's EPG. So the EPG is kind of the overlay where. Um, that you can navigate um, cable channels or over the air channels if you have those. Um, but also in that same EPG, um, you can see channel wise, the, um, the channels that are offered by Zumo and Pluto and, uh, and a few others. So um, that means that, uh, you know, even if you're not confident in digging around finding apps, um, you still discover uh, the channels that, uh, that are on these fast services. And, uh, uh, again, somewhat counterintuitive. People thought, you know, the EPG was a thing of the past or something that was just uh, part of the linear or OTA world. But um, uh, yeah, that's uh, that, that's really how we improve that discovery element. We got an, a question from the audience actually coming in that I think is interesting, and, and maybe you, Paul, would like to to elaborate a bit. It's India. It hasn't been mentioned as a continent or in a region or or. How is the adoption in, in India? And, and do we have any stats or figures or, or comments on that? Um, yeah, we, we do quite a bit of content uh, delivery in, in India. Obviously, it's a sizable country. It's kind of a market to itself. Um, we, you know, we deliver a lot with uh, Samsung India in particular is probably the, the most popular platform in that region. Um, I, I just actually pulled up uh, some metrics on that. We were doing, uh, last month, we did about two and a half million impressions uh, in, in India alone. So, you know, significant, you know, volume for, for one country in, a, in an area that's, you know, f fast growing. So I think it, it's a, a positive trend from, from what we're seeing. Uh, I think uh, they have, you know, a history of rich content uh, that's very local to them. So I, I, I think of all the you know, countries in the Asia Pac region, um, India is probably the best suited in terms of a content library and you know viewing behavior that uh, is well suited for fast and and you know themed channels and all the content you would expect to roll out of Bollywood uh, is is prime for for uh, fast fast delivery. Talking about ad loads and, and these type of things, what about advertisers? Are, are they appreciating fast and for, for what reasons? Do you have any data on that, Brett, or any comments? Um, so interestingly, one of the things that we've, we in, in uh, and actually this is probably something Stefan and Olivier can probably speak to as well, is um, in talking, we work with a number of agencies, ad agencies, and one of the things we've heard from them that they like about FAST is that there is a greater guarantee of the brand, that their brand is associated with brands, television brands that, uh, that they know and they can recognize and they can buy based on that. Um, there is a concern by some, not all, but some that having their brand just available on AVOD and other places Sometimes can you can show up in places that they don't want. So, uh, so there's been some concern about that. Now, I will say that the um, fast is new and emerging and evolving. So there's a lot of broad viewership 
Um, but it's certainly not as deep of viewership in terms of quantity of viewing as broadcast TV or premium television or areas like that. So the, the amount of money spent in broadcast is massive in comparison. So in terms of the ad space for fast, it's still evolving. Uh, and so there, we're really going to see some changes, ongoing changes, particularly if we talk internationally where it's, it, there are some differences there. So it's just one of the things we've been hearing about that and one of the benefits that FAST provides over uh, AVOD. Is that the same thing you see, Olivier? I mean, the, uh, yeah, I mean, I would, I would add a, a bit more details to that because I think there is, the first thing is that a service like Pluto, most of the usage is taking place in the living room on big screen devices, whether it's uh, smart TVs, uh, uh, on Roku and Fur TV, on game console. So, and the inventory that we're creating because it's fast is it's full screen, it's non-skippable ads, and it's pure brands, it's really brand safe because we are curating the content. So if you compare that to like a platform like YouTube, even if they're doing a lot, there is still an algorithm will drive the user somewhere else. Um, in our case, we know exactly what kind of content will come after this one. And that gives a guarantee to the advertisers that their ads will be placed in a very brand and premium, uh, brand safe and premium environment. So I think that is very important for them. Um, and, and I think having said that, that we are mainly a CTV product, it means actually that you are reaching the users with full screen ads, non-skippable in the living room. So you have like a, the impact of a TV ad with the measurement and the targetability of the digital business. And that is a huge USP for advertisers. And clearly the US are very advanced as a market, but we see the trend coming in, in, in all the international market. I mean, we were fully sold out in Q4 in most of our territories, for example, and, and we see all the agencies creating now dedicated CTV unit within their, uh, their, uh, their, their, uh, their agency. So the, the shift is happening. And I think what I like, and I think what is the, why it's, so, uh, it's such an incredible potential. On the one end, you are able with fast services to reach the traditional TV advertisers, which are willing to shift budget to a more measurable and targetable in, uh, uh, audience. That's the first thing. And on top of that, reach a new audience, which is not on TV, the streaming junkies and so on, which is a hard to reach audience. And the second point that we don't talk that much about is TV is still very expensive and most of the brands are not able to uh, afford like a big TV campaign. But any advertisers can do a CTV campaign because you can choose the volume, you can do a small campaign. And we see more and more like call it traditional mobile and web advertisers moving to CTV as a brand tool. And that's, I think, open a brand new opportunity because you can really target the entire world of advertisers with fast. And I know you see it's the same, the same thing, Stefan, or yeah, I think do you see the same thing, Stefan, or do you have any other angles or, or take on this? No, ab absolutely. I mean, I mean, first at a very high level, advertisers are going to move to where the eyeballs are. And this is as we've just detailed in this in this panel, eyeballs are are easily moved to fast right now, right? And or or we wouldn't have this panel. So um <laughs> <laughs> so so that that's sort of instigating advertisement advertisers movement to where people are consuming the content but to Olivier's point this is full screen non-skippable ads with with a targeting capability which is not something they've traditionally had on on television and so therefore you get sort of more accurate um the advertisers can make more accurate buys reach the right demographic reach the right uh, people. What I would say is, you know, the the well lit streets of brand channels is a is a big draw, but we don't typically, um, and certainly we've made a case of not selling against specific brand channels, you know, and, and causing market confusion with with the brand owners. Um, but they know that they're going to be, you know, this genre, this uh demographic this segment that they're looking for and so you can end up 
pushing the prices higher because it is that CTV non-skippable ad, but with targeting. Um, and so you you have digital advertisers that know how to play in that world, but then have to pay the premiums of a of a large screen experience, which makes the which makes it good for both the content partners, the platforms, and ultimately um, the clients. Do we have any differences between AVOD and Fast in this sense, or is AVOD more maybe less big screen like, or do we see any differences from the brands or or the advertisers coming into? For, for our platform, we've really done both from the beginning. So, um, you know, most of our partners are contributing AVOD to support their channels. And the reason for that is sort of a deeper engagement. Um, you may see what's on live and say, hey, I don't really like that show, but oh, they have this show. I'll go binge watch this in the AVOD section, right? But uh, from an advertising standpoint, that's still playing back in that full screen, non-skippable um, targeted area. So, so it's, it's no different for the advertiser. For the audience, it gives them control. It gives them the ability to watch when they want to watch, to bookmark things, that sort of thing. But also, uh, also it becomes a deeper engagement experience and, and a stickier platform. Yeah. So it, it's spreading spreading quite globally now, but are there any barriers? What would hinder the global expansion of FAST? I think you had some views on, on, on that, uh, Nick, when we talked. Yeah, so uh, clearly we're talking, um, you know, from a, from a US perspective on a lot of this, because many of the companies uh, <clears throat> we're talking about today are, uh, you know, US based. Um, I think as you, uh, uh, you know, as you go to some of these other um, markets around the world, um, the uh, advertisers and the ad agencies um, are still kind of catching up on what CTV can do. And uh, I think the uh, the challenge, which uh, I'm sure Stefan and Olivier can, can talk about much better than I can, is uh, as you enter a new market um, outside of the US, um, finding those um, tech savvy and um, CTV savvy advertisers is, and, uh, and ad agencies is, um, uh, you know, a potential barrier. Um, I think they you know, they can't ignore the success that um, the FAST has had globally, but, um, you know, maybe they, they don't yet have the, uh, um, you know, the, the capability to, uh, to capitalize on it. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, we're in the early stages of this across Europe and, and the US is very large. I just, I just said advertisers go where the eyeballs are. When you start going territory by territory, um, it can become a very small market very quickly. But as more players, as Pluto continues to grow in those areas, as the OEMs continue to grow uh, their fast services in those areas, it becomes more scale, it moves more of the agencies, it moves more of the eyeballs because they're gonna follow the scale. Um, you know, and Zumo today as a brand name isn't necessarily wide across Europe. Um, we're more of a supportive role for people like LG Channels or Rakuten's Avod service or, or Samsung TV Plus, but, um, but it, it's similar in that you need that scale to draw the advertisers and when and when you're trying to localize content localize an ad experience the uh, sometimes the scale uh, is is lagging a little bit behind for the advertisers paul where do you see the hinders or potential barriers for further expansion yeah i think what what nick and stefan have touched on are, are match reality with what we're and what we're seeing is uh we certainly aren't seeing uh, I mean, we're certainly seeing adoption grow across, well, just globally, you know, EMEA and APAC and LATAM are really picking it up for us. Um, the, the ad fill, the ad, uh, you know, the demand side isn't quite there, you know, as what, what we're seeing in the US. Uh, but I think it also wasn't that long ago, we were talking about fast and talking about uh, issues with frequency and uh, ad fill and timeouts. And I don't hear that quite as much as I used to. So I think you know, there is a lag you know, globally, uh, but with the way content is being you know, brought into fast channels and, and even AVOD, um, 
I, I think we'll see that shift. Uh, I, I, I imagine we'll see the TAM and, and Asia PAC, uh, you know, leg uh, EMEA, but uh, there's so much potential in those regions and there's so much content that is so specific to those regions that we'll, we'll see adoption there as well. So uh, I think, you know, ideally that works itself out. Uh, the, the other things that Nick touched on earlier was around um, payment as being, you know, a barrier to subscription services in, in uh, LATAM specifically. And so as we see Veer's drift towards uh, Latin, our AVOD and FAST services, um, what, what I guess I get concerned about in, in regions like that is the fragmentation of devices and TV manufacturers and uh, you know how much that fractures the, the landscape for us. I, I don't know if I have an answer for that, but I'd be curious to get others take on it. But uh, I mean, that was one of the, always one of our concerns in building apps, OTT apps in those emerging regions in the past was there's so much fragmentation across devices and um, the way viewers consume information. Local content and localization, as also we mentioned a couple of times here, is a key mm -hmm. factor. And, and, and especially for me living in Sweden, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about uh, the cooperation that, that uh, you guys at Blued are doing with Nent in, in the Nordics and, and combining a local provider with, with your services. Yes, I mean, that's, uh, that's really uh, for a, a super exciting partnership and really, I think, a uh, a transformative and, uh, partnership that we've been closing with NAND for the launch in the Nordic, which will happen uh, uh, in, the, in the next coming months. Um, and the way we, uh, we decided to enter the market is to combine the pan-Nordic leading uh, AVOD platform via free, which is owned and operated by NAND, into Pluto TV. So what is in for the, uh, for the users they will find the best of fast and the best of on demand and catch up uh, on Pluto TV. So there will be really a fast and on and a super strong fast offering and a super strong uh, on demand offering. Um, and and on top of that, we will be able to really offer um, the best of local content, where is coming from there with amazing productions such as Paradise Hotel. Uh, and uh, and also the um, the best of Vacom CBS and obviously also leveraging uh, all the uh, the licensing partners that we are uh, that we are having. So it's a great way to really build uh, a free streaming champion in the regions by partnering with a free to air network. Then we'll be representing uh, uh, Plus TV uh, from a net sales point of view. And I think it's also what we are also what we didn't talk about is. Obviously, if you have a look at the advertising market, especially the digital advertising market, a big part of the market is uh, taken by the GAFAs, uh, but the advertisers want to have alternatives to the GAFAs. And building uh, a local champion uh, um, is, um, is, is, I think, uh, uh, something which is very important. That's really what is, the, uh, what is in this partnership. I think it's a perfect win-win partnership uh, between Pluto TV and, and NEN in that case. And this is the kind of partnership we are uh, obviously looking to uh, replicate in other territories. Coming in question from the audience, and I think that touched upon one of our topics that we plan to bring up anyway, is that it's premium content, uh, real live events, uh, premium sport. Will, will we see that in the fast channels or we do already do, but will we see more of, of premium content, uh, original content, uh, these type of things. I don't know who is the best to, to answer or comment on that. I, I can start. Um, <clears throat> I think you see this evolution happening um, and has happened and, and will continue to evolve uh, on the content side of it. So when we first started Zumo uh, in 2015, it was a lot of, uh, you know, publishers, sort of social video stitched together, kind of uh, whoever had sort of a bucket of content, right? That needed linearization. Um, and that evolved very, very quickly to where you have major media companies creating fast channels with their library of, of content um, to today where you have these platforms trying to differentiate, right? So I think you have two things. You have 
platforms trying to differentiate by doing exclusive deals with movie studios, uh, perhaps investing in original content, um, looking at uh, sort of premium channels, which may involve uh, live sports uh, and, and live event type programming on, on, I think all of our platforms, be in sports is, is, a, is a prime example, which is delivered by Amagi and, and lives on our platform, which has League One and, uh, and other, um, you know, global football matches and, and live sports. So, so that does exist today. I think the, the problem is going to be it's going to squeeze out. Uh, I don't know about problem, but the, it will squeeze out some of those original people that moved quick to get into the space that had just a finite library or some content or a good brand, but not necessarily producing for this platform. And you'll see sort of, uh, um, you know, sunsetting of some of the original digital players that maybe can't keep up with the demand of a 24 seven linear channel and some of the bigger players coming in and saying, hey, this is alternative distribution to our cable deals here in the US or to our international deals. And we wanna make sure that we're playing in this space. Any other comments around that? Well, I can add a little bit. Uh, one of the things we see on, on the platform as, as Stefan alluded to is, you know, the, the, the premier sports, you know, that are being delivered a lot of times are even still gated behind, you know, a subscription or, you know, a, a hard authentication, maybe MVPD access requirements uh, on some of these platforms, uh, you know, that would make our mixing in live, live sporting events and uh, with their, you know, fast experiences, their linear experiences. Uh, but we're also seeing uh, a lot of this, I guess some of it comes down to what you define as premium content um, is, you know, some of the uh, sporting events, you know, are, are, can be a bit more niche and, and maybe that's premium to you. Um, I think we'll start to see, you know, niche content become more available on these platforms where the mixing and the live experience, you know, in between, uh, you know, the VOD assets that are stacked up on, on both ends of it, you know, there's a lot of content out there that, you know, people are watching anywhere from, you know, live poker to, you know, live lawnmower racing. Um, and, and so there's an audience for that. There's also uh, pretty popular music events that are being stacked in between uh, music videos on some of the popular music video channels. And so I think that'll continue to evolve. Uh, you know, I, content rights will play a big role in, you know, how these this content becomes available and which content becomes available, but uh, we're seeing an audience for it already. Olivia, you sounded like you wanted to. to yeah, I, I think I want to add a couple of things um, from a Pluto point of view. I mean, the first thing I can only echo what uh, what Stephen was saying. I mean, a few years ago, I remember going to MIPCOM and everyone was closing the door. Uh, and, and now they're uh, open the door when you say I'm working for Pluto or where I'm doing fast services were well, amazing. So I think the world is changing fast. Uh, and I think one of the reasons is that they're start seeing really a great return on invest. I mentioned that in the intro, you know, we reached the one billion dollar revenue with Pluto. So we are paying significant money back to the uh, licensors and obviously helps getting better content and better content. Uh, the second thought is when it comes also to original content, um, you know, it may come to a point where the fast services or the ever will go regional. There is already some example, but there is such a great library to be monetized uh, available. And the SVD market is going regional because it's a key driver of, of, of subscription to have new originals and so on. But uh, I think on the, uh, on the free space, and it's quite similar to what you see on TV, a good blockbusters remains a good blockbusters and will perform very well on, on free streaming services and will be very appreciated also by advertisers. So um, I think I'm a big defender of like really monetizing this incredible uh, library. And obviously we're quite lucky at Viacom CBS because we're sitting on one of the biggest library, uh, Paramount, sorry, uh, need to get used to that. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Um, you managed but, 55 minutes, that's good enough. So, but uh, <laughs> but really, really it's, uh, it's something which uh, we're really building an ecosystem
system and and obviously having this deep library from the Perman network the showtime the mtv the nick is a is a fantastic asset obviously um, and we need to play with the right windowing strategy but we are really willing to bring more and more you know premium content i mean recently in europe for example we premiered the season four of uh, star trek discovery on pluto tv uh, and I think uh, that's that was uh, like a premiere uh, in this territory. So the, the world is moving, and I think the bigger uh, the ad market will be, then the the more premium content uh, uh, we will see on the uh, on those uh, fast and 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 free uh, uh, ad supported uh, platform. We're running out of time here, and it's been a really good discussion. And I think we need to apply for yet another hour somewhere else. But it's a lot of positive is around fast and AVOD and can we have too much? Can we get too many channels? Can we get too many services? Will we see channel churn and saturation in the market? Will we get over flooded by fast channels? I mean, we're yeah. over flooded by broadcast and cable, cable channels at, at one point. So I, uh, and ultimately in, in the pay TV space, there, had, there was consolidation of, uh, of channels. I know that Paramount, um, Viacom itself actually consolidated down from many, many channels down to key channels that they were going to support. So that's, I think that's common in the industry. Um, the question is, it's so easy to create a fast channel today. How many of them stay relevant in terms of being able to draw viewers? If you look at Twitch, you have some, uh, which is live streaming. You have some that have 300,000 viewers and you have some that have two or none. So I think the market kind of will affect that. And there will be services. So Sony may have uh, its own set of unique channels as opposed for, from others that have their own set of unique channels. So the ability to, to differentiate, I think, will be important to be able to draw niche groups of consumers to that platform. That's going to be the balance in the future is it's not just some, just big channels that, that get lots of people, but the cheerleading channel or Olympic, uh, Olympic sport channel. I'm sorry, Stefan. Oh, no, I, I was just going to say that I think you're right. And I, I would also say it depends if we're talking about right now today, or as we look down the road, because right now today, there's a finite EPG sort of fixed uh, UI that that um, for platforms like ours, we sunset low performing channels, we sunset channels that can't support uh, an audience or the return that Olivier is talking about um, because it's, it, it, it draws share of voice uh, away from others, you know, or, or it makes a bad user experience. But I think as you look to the future, as these platforms start to personalize um, the experience, you can dive deeper into the niche channels. You can dive deeper into more channels because the usage and discovery will be driven by by the by the user and therefore you can sort of expand your channel list. Excellent final words because I see Eric popping into the screen and that means that we're running out of time. <laughs> we could have e, can we get was, another hour, Eric? Uh, you know, you guys can keep going. Unfortunately, we're going to be in another Zoom. But, you, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but who knows? People might stick around. Um, and uh, that really was terrific. Thanks, Magnus, for putting together such a great uh, list of questions and topics. And thanks to all of our panelists for taking those running with them and taking them in directions we didn't necessarily expect. That really was great. Um, looking forward to hearing, you know, sort of checking in in six months to see how things have changed in terms of international fast adoption and development. I'd like to thank our audience for joining us once again. The winner of the Amazon gift card is Desmond Vassell or Vassell. Desmond, keep an eye on your email for information about that. And of course, I'd like to thank Bird Dog, Harmonic, and Amagi for sponsoring and helping to make all of this possible. We'll see you in a half hour, those of you who are more on the production side of things, as we look at uh, NDI, SRT, and live streaming, a complete departure from this panel. So switching things up here. So long. Bye.